Okay, so um, okay, so as the class winds down, uh, you know, sort of everything we've done in this class has been, you know, worst case analysis, mostly of kind of end to end, you know, algorithms. We take some input, we do something, we output something. Uh, besides kind of designing these algorithms, also sort of uh, exploring all the implications of what it means to be going for worst case running times and and all these funny things that sometimes show up on the negative side, things like MP completeness. Okay. So, you know, I'm only really trying to introduce, you know, two more main topics before the end of the, the semester. There's sort of a buffer built into the schedule at the end. Uh, uh, and I'm not trying to assign any new homeworks in the last two weeks. So, okay, so, but the, the two topics are unified uh, by, in some sense of the word, doing an average case analysis of the algorithms, okay? But it's going to be a, a very qualified, sorry guys. You know, in a certain qualified sense of the word average, um, where you'll see that, that we won't be sacrificing any of the kind of robustness and sort of the, the it's really any of the robustness, okay? Uh, any of the robustness of worst case analysis, okay? So one thing really nice about worst case analysis, it's it's very pessimistic, but then it becomes very reliable when you reuse things thereafter, okay? And although uh, we will sort of relax this perspective a little bit, we won't lose that kind of very strong theoretical guarantees we'll have to. When we get there, I'll explain what we mean. So uh, it'll be two varieties. One is called amortized analysis, mostly associated with data structures, although uh, one of the lectures will be talking about kind of how to use uh, amortized analysis to get some faster max flow algorithms, which is fun. But today we'll mostly talk about data structures. The other is, is randomized algorithms. And this will be a different sense of the word average. It'll be average over random bits. And, uh, you know, among other topics, we'll do stuff like hash tables, randomized sorting, which is all very practical. So, you know, uh, maybe one thing I'll point out, the things that we're doing uh, is going to be a little bit different perspective in a sense that we're going for slightly different style guarantees. Uh, however, I think everything we'll talk about is, in fact, quite uh, practical. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss some data structures and algorithms that are used every day. Um, uh, so, yeah. Okay, so that's that's sort of the game plan for the rest of the semester with, you know, some time built in just to review and stuff like that. Okay, so. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit. I, we've all done this line of code before. I plus plus where I take an integer and I increment it by one, right? Uh, and we probably never thought anything about calling I plus plus, right? No big deal. So, but let's look at what's kind of going on um, in terms of the bits, okay? So we start off with, with zero, of course. I call I plus plus and I get one. Okay, so it's a constant time operation. I flip one bit. I flip the least significant bit from zero to one. I flip another bit. We get the number two. That's represented by one, zero. Again, no big deal. So the constant time, I basically flip one bit. I flip another bit. I get one, one, right? I flip one more bit. We get to number four. All right, I increment once. And what's sort of curious compared to the previous increments is that this time I found myself flipping two bits, or maybe three, in the sense that I reset both of the ones to zero, and then I I added one more one. Okay. So as I increase each integer by one. Over time, I find myself gradually flipping more and more bits. Okay. Um, 
Okay, obviously that doesn't seem like a big deal. Uh, maybe a slightly more exaggerated example, right? Is when I have, uh, I think this is supposed to be 32 ones. Let's hope it is. And uh, so, okay, so this is representing uh, 2 to the 32 minus 1 or something like that. So something like 4 million something. And uh, now if I want to call I++, plus plus, right? Now I find myself flipping a lot of bits because the next number, of course, is going to replace all those ones with zeros followed by a one. Okay, so now it's taking me 32 time to increment a number. Okay, of course, uh, you know, uh, most of the time you're just doing 30 bit integers and there's some hardware accelerations and sort of one CPU operation, but never mind that. Uh, the point is, though, that uh, for sake of discussion, in general, when I kind of have k bits, you know, uh, I may need uh, up to k flips, right? There's some sort of running time, worst case, that's proportional to the number of bits out there, okay? But then, of course, uh, we've all used I++ a million gazillion times, and we never thought anything of it, and uh, the question is, should we be worried or not? Okay. So, okay. So when I when I use I plus plus, sometimes it's in a loop or something. You know, maybe what I'm not really so much interested is not kind of in the worst case when I call I plus plus, what's the maximum number of bits I'm going to flip on just one call to I plus plus. It's usually in the context of okay, I'm increasing from one to n I plus plus I plus plus I plus plus. How many total bits do I flip, right? So it's, some, it's usually in the context of a bigger algorithm. And, and what I'm really interested in is kind of how much total time I spend incrementing, not so much in what's the worst case of one increment times n, okay? So, so for example, the first bit, the least significant bit, as I go from one to n, that bit gets flipped every single time, right? That's not too surprising. So over the course of uh, counting from one to n, I'll end up flipping the least significant bit n times, right? Okay, now let's look at the second bit, right? So this bit, I guess, is worth two points, okay? How often do I flip the second bit? As I count from one time, yeah, yeah, okay, every two times. So on a whole, I end up flipping, you know, n over two times. Let's just pretend n is a power of two; otherwise, I'd be rounding down or something. Okay. Okay. Now, what about every th the third bit? Okay, so this bit is worth, I guess, four points. How often do I find myself flipping the third bit? Yeah. Every four times, not three times, right? Because it's still going up by powers of two. Consequently, I flip a total of n over four times. Okay, now you guys probably see the pattern. Let's look at the kth bit. Maybe k is 100, but in general, the kth bit flips how many, how often? Yeah. Okay, one over every two to the k minus one time. Okay, and so as a result, You know, as I count from one to n, I, I flip that bit n over two to the k minus one times, maybe round it down, okay? So, okay, so if I add all that up, you know, what is the total time, total number of bits I flip? So I count from one to n, different bits are getting flipped at slightly different rates. How many bits do I end up flipping total? How many total bits will I end up flipping as I increment from one to n?
ja. Ja, 2N. Right, a little less than 2N or something, right? This is our, our kind of favorite geometric sequence, right? N plus N over 2 plus N over 4 plus N over 8. You know, that 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth, that'll all add up to 2. Okay. So as you increment from 1 to N, even though, you know, there's some non-uniformity, one increment may flip many bits, the next increment flips very few, on average, you're flipping 2 bits. Sort of no matter where you stop n and stuff like that. So, okay. So you spend, you know, as you might have expected, about linear time total for n increments. So in a certain sense, you're spending constant time on average. Sort of when you look back in hindsight, I spent n time on n operations. Each operation on average took constant time, which is probably what you always thought of when you called I++. Plus plus. Okay. And so this is what we will call constant amortized time. Okay, so let's just sort of justify sort of these natural bulk operations. Okay. All right, so, okay. So when I say an operation takes some T amortized time, that means that if I, if I call the operation N times, it's possible that the first call takes a long time, the second call takes a short amount of time. It's, it's possible that the individual calls to the operation may vary, okay? But it all needs to add up to n times t, okay? So when I say t amortized time, I really mean in hindsight, it always needs to look like n times t on average, okay? But no matter kind of the order of operations or whatever, okay? So you still need to have some sort of worst case input guarantee. So in the worst case, in hindsight, on average, it looks like t time, okay? So, okay, so uh, it doesn't have to be one operation. We're gonna study data structures, you know, a stack you can push and you can pop, a queue you can insert and you can delete with multiple operations. And for each operation, they might have different individual amortized time. So if I say that, uh, you know, operation one takes T1, oper you know, amortized time and operation K takes TK amortized time and stuff like that. Then if I, if I find myself calling a sequence of like, okay, I first called some operation first plus some operation second and some operation third, okay? No matter the order of operations, I require that the total time I spend sums up the corresponding kind of amortized time. So the total time should be at most TI1 plus TI2 plus TI3, so forth, okay? Well, we'll do a lot of examples so the definition will become more clear. But you're sort of declaring these, these, these uh, running times ahead of time, even though each operation may take more than the individual TI in real time, but sort of in hindsight, the total running time should be bounded above by what these t's add up to. Okay, so this is this is very practical. You'll see that some of the data structures we study today are data structures that you've used many times before and less contrived of an example than binary counters. Okay, so, all right, so, okay, how do you do amortized analysis? It's a little bit, you know, awkward because you have to zoom out appropriately so you can understand things in the aggregate. One approach is to do a direct analysis like we just, just did, you know, just take any sequence of operations and add them all up and show it's at most NT. Uh, and then there's other kind of shortcuts or metaphors to help you think about amortized analysis and, and possibly make it easier depending on the situation. So I'll, I'll discuss two. One is sort of based on uh, sort of uh, paying for credit upfront that can be exchanged for doing some work later. This is sometimes called the banker method. And the other is sort of uh, inspired by, by physics. It's called the potential function method. Um, and, and really they're kind of uh, metaphors to help you kind of shortcut some calculations and, and help you think about how to obtain amortized times. So let me, let me demonstrate these two uh, methods on the, the very simple 
binary counter example so you get a quick sense. Okay, so so credit schemes. Uh, the idea is, uh, you know, with each operation, maybe I also pay a little extra ahead of time in, in sort of stored credit. Okay, I imagine sort of buying running time. And then later when I need to do a big operation, like I need to flip a lot of bits or I need to do garbage collection or something, I can exchange those credits to pay for the running time. Okay, that would be the, the general style. And, and in general, you know, you'll, you'll come up with something like, oh, every time you flip a bit, pay for some credits here and there, you'll come up with some idea. And then what you'll do is you'll take your operation and you'll bound the sum of the running time plus uh, how much the credit went up. So you kind of pay for credit. Although possibly if you want to cash out your credit, you can decrease the total credit in your account. Uh, and, and offset some of the increased running time when that big operation appears. So let me give uh, an example for binary counter. I meant to erase this. Okay, so, okay. To, to analyze that simple example of a binary counter, okay, every time I increment, I might imagine, you don't actually have, the code doesn't actually do this. This is just kind of a thought experiment. Okay, so it's, it's more on paper. But I imagine buying one credit and putting it, sort of placing it on the first bit. Okay. And I imagine buying half a credit. These are infinitely divisible. You can do whatever you want, I guess. And you can buy half a credit and I'm gonna kind of place it on the second bit. The placing is just to help me uh, organize my thinking as I'll explain. I'm gonna imagine you know, buying one fourth a credit and placing it on the third bit, okay? and so forth, and in general, you know, on the ith bit, buying the appropriate fraction of a credit and placing it on that bit. Okay, so I just kind of imagine doing that in the analysis. The algorithm doesn't actually have to do this. Okay. And the point is I, I'm buying a total of two credits. Okay. Now I think of each of those credits as something that I can kind of cash out and pay for constant work later on, okay. but I'm kind of paying for it up front. So when I, when I buy these total of two units of credit, I sort of take my, my current running time and I'll sort of say, okay, that's, I pay another constant for credits that I've, I've placed on my bits. Okay. All right, but what's, what's convenient about this? Now, whenever I need to flip, we've already talked about how, you know, the second bit flips every two times. Right, but every time I call increment, I put half a credit on the second bit. So you know, each of those every two times, when I find myself needing to flip the second bit, I have one credit there to pay for it. Okay, so whenever I need to flip one of those extra bits, I'm going to use that credit pay for the flip. Okay, you know, same with the third bit. Uh, every four times I need to flip it, but Every four rounds, I will have acquired one full credit to put on that fourth bit. Okay, so it's sort of a, a way to think of each increment, even the ones that are only flipping one bit, as sort of partially paying for those big increments in the future. Okay. So the rule is, uh, maybe credit's a bad word, because the rule is that you, you can't use credits you don't have. So you have to always maintain a, a, non, a positive balance, a non-negative balance. But sort of in this in this credit metaphor, I'm I'm sort of paying for the running time ahead of time. Okay. All right. So, okay. So that's that's the that's the general idea. You know, you come up with some kind of in the analysis. Oh, I pay for credits, and maybe I organize the credits in a particular way, so it's easier to discuss. And 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 I can cash out those credits later to you know pay for for extra operations. All right, so that, that's one scheme. Uh, another scheme is, is um, inspired by physics, like I said. The idea is uh, to come up with a quote unquote potential. So, you know, uh, I guess in physics, like uh, you always have this potential energy where if you fall to the ground, it'll hurt. Um, 
So uh, here, you know, by the way, there are some implicit similarities to credit schemes and stuff like that. That's okay. You know, these are mostly metaphors to help us think. Uh, but the idea is we come up with some potential function that usually reflects the state of whatever data structure you're maintaining. Hopefully, that'll be made clear in an example in a moment. And uh, the rule is it has to be non-negative and start at zero. And uh, at some level, kind of as the potential goes up, I pay for it right away. Uh, but when the potential goes down, I could possibly cash out that energy released from the potential to pay for some extra operations. Okay. Especially at the level of binary counter, it might seem very similar to, to charging schemes, but that's okay. Okay, so okay, so let's do a potential function for the binary counter. Okay. So I might define a potential function to be in my, my string of bits to be the total number of bits set to one. Okay, so the phi increases whenever a bit goes up from zero to one, and then phi decreases whenever a bit goes from one to zero. Okay, so it's measuring some quote unquote potential, some state of my data structure. Okay. Now, every time I call increase, right? Uh, I flip. Uh, you know, we always end up flipping a bunch of ones to zero and at most one zero to one. Okay, so flipping that zero to one, uh, you know, increases my potential by one. Okay, but the real issue is, okay, what happens when I find myself carrying lots of ones? And uh, I guess from your point of view, anyway, when you find yourself uh, carrying a lot of ones and you have to flip a lot of ones back down to zero, that's when there's a lot of work. But the good news is that every time you flip a one down to zero, your potential also decreases by one because you have one less bit set to one in your function. Okay, so we use the potential function to sort of pay for the 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 extra running time. So if I look at the actual time in my increase where I'm flipping like ten bits, where nine bits are getting flipped from one to zero or something like that. My potential will also go down by roughly nine. Okay. And the going down by nine will offset uh, the nine units of time required to flip nine extra bits. Okay. So that's uh, another way to sort of set up your amortized analysis is try to find uh, some kind of quote unquote potential function uh, where a decrease in potential could offset. Uh, all those extra expensive operations. Okay, so, oh, I had something, but it didn't get copied. Okay, that's okay. All right, so those are the, those are the, um, okay. Okay, so those are the three main uh, the methods that'll come up. There's a couple other methods out there. You can look them up if you want to, but I think these will, these are simple and they suffice. You know, at the end of the day, you do want to appeal to the actual amortized definition, right? It should it should tell you something about the total running time at the end. Uh, and then we have these two two kind of indirect methods: this idea of paying for credits and cashing them in later, or setting up a potential function uh, that can get discharged and pay for your operations. Um, okay. All right. Okay, so hopefully this will be made more clear uh, with some examples. Uh, let's see, can I? Okay, it's not worth it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, uh, we're missing one slide, but that's okay. So in the notes, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a quick little proof showing how just in general, if you set up a credit scheme and you follow the rules where you don't uh, spend credits you don't use, and you just upper bound the running time plus the change in credit, that will lead to kind of amortized bounds in that very technical sense, the initial sense, uh, and same with potential functions, okay? But you're just kind of adding things up uh, uh, 
that. It's not too interesting. Okay. All right. So, but I think it's more more valuable to to work through some examples to get a better sense of intuition uh, for these two methods. Okay. And actually, I think uh, everything, all the data structures we'll see today. I think our data structures you guys already know well. Okay. Starting with binary search trees. Okay, so binary search trees. Uh, I assume this was a main topic in the data structures class, but uh, you know we have a tree. Each node represents a key. So here I'm doing the the one where keys are in nodes, not just at the leaves. Uh, and the rule is very simple. Uh, if I look at a particular node here, the node has key five. All the keys in the left subtree need to be smaller. All the keys to the right subtree need to be bigger. Right? Simple way of organizing things. Okay. But uh, that leads to a lot of very practical and interesting operations. Uh, I can try to figure out if a key is in my tree. Uh, I could try to find the first key bigger than a tree in case the key isn't in the tree. I can list all the keys between two keys. I can figure out how many keys are between two keys. I guess you guys might have had an infinite number of exercises in the past. Not sure. Okay, so this is a warm up. Okay, so if I have this binary search tree and I want to know, um, does it contain the number seven? I think clearly the answer is no, but what does the, the algorithm do? We start at the root, right? And I look at the key, that's 10. Okay, seven is not 10 and seven is smaller than 10. So I go to the left, right? I look at this root of this subtree, that's five. Seven is bigger than five. So we go to the right. Okay, this one is eight. That's not seven. Seven smaller than eight. I go to the left. Six. Okay, that's not seven. Seven is bigger. I would go to the right, and then I would realize the tree doesn't have seven. Okay. All right. Now, if I wanted to list all the keys between seven and 18, right? Then, you know, I would do two searches and sort of identify where seven and 18 would be. So I guess in this example, seven and 18 aren't in the tree, but I've sort of marked where they should be, All right? So you might do a search and, you know, reach this point, okay? And now as you sort of crawl back up the tree or uh, the search path, first, you know, you can figure out you know, which of these nodes are in this range. Okay. Uh, and in particular, they're the, they're the nodes that you would go in a certain direction. Okay, and then you would also have these subtrees that hang off on the inside of the two search paths. These are also in between. All right, so you can kind of crawl back up and you write your uh, recursive code that does this, this walking through a tree. Yeah, question? Uh, okay, good, good. So uh, I guess we haven't talked too much about performance yet. Why not traverse the whole tree and then just print out the ones that come in between? Sure, uh, but then you're traversing the whole tree. So one hope is a data structure is, let's say that the range is relatively small compared to the whole tree. And maybe I can just do a short walk and then just, I would really like to get running time proportional to the number of keys in between once I have the data structure set up as opposed to compared to all the keys, right? Just like you would in any database, you have lots of data, but you want a little bit of information that is uh, the general nature of the beast, okay? So this example maybe isn't great, well, because everything is small and we haven't really opened up the discussion of running time yet, okay? All right, uh, other operations. Okay, if, you, if I wanted to count, the number of keys between, I guess, here, 5 and 25, okay? 
So then I would probably, you know, do some kind of search for where five, five is in the tree and sort of 25 would be here. Okay. And based on this, I would kind of count, okay, there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or something like that. Hopefully I counted correctly. Uh, right? Which is roughly what we just did in terms of I can list all the keys between five and 25 and then just count how many get returned. Okay. But you can do things a little bit more clever. Uh, does anyone have a way to extend? This data structure, uh, sort of high level speaking, that could potentially shortcut having to count everything individually. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah, in this example, it looks like it's all but a couple, but but that won't necessarily help. Um, okay, so here I should have erased it, but here I've actually annotated. Um, every subtree with a number of nodes uh, in the subtree. Okay. So let me stretch this out. Okay. So as I maintain the subtree and I insert and delete things, we haven't talked much about insertion or deletion yet. I could also keep track for every subtree of the total number of nodes in the subtree. Okay. Because then you know, when I have five, I know that everything in the right subchild is going to be between five and 25 in that right subtree. And if I've already written down there's three, I could just say, oh, there's three. Okay, and I don't have to go and inspect every single one. The same with here, you know, I can just write down, oh, there's two uh, and just be done with it. Okay, I, it doesn't seem very dramatic with this example, but imagine a much bigger, bigger tree. Okay, and then as a result, your running time is sort of proportional to kind of how long the short the search paths are, as opposed to actually the total number of keys, because you sort of have these two search paths that will take some time, but then you can just sum up the subtrees that hang off the search path. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so that's the point: is that even these aggregate operations, in general, the real thing that we find ourselves focusing on is what is the height of the tree, okay? So the height of the tree really gives an upper bound on how long the search can be, because each search goes down one level. And if you have low, uh, very low height, then other tricks like, you know, saving a number of keys in every subtree and can facilitate lots of other useful operations, okay? All right, so, okay. All right, so, you know, there's a good case and there's a bad case. On the left, I give you a perfectly balanced tree, right? This is the minimum height, binary height attainable for those nodes. On the right, uh, I give you a very bad tree. Okay. All right, so, all right, let's talk a little bit about how to insert new keys. Suppose I wanted to insert the number seven. or maybe check to see if it's already in the tree or something. Then the most natural thing is I just search, you know, because at first I have to figure out if even seven's in the tree. If seven's in the tree, fine, I'm done. But otherwise, maybe I figure out where seven would be if it was a leaf. I get to the bottom of the tree, okay? And then that's where I'll put seven. I'll just put seven there. And in that way, I've added a uh, new key to my tree. No big deal. Okay. But the only problem, what's the, what, what's, uh, what's risky about this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I want to avoid situations like this. And the suggestion was, okay, if I had, say, inserted one, okay, first, then I inserted two, then I inserted three, then I inserted four, then five, then six, then seven. For, first of all, that's a very predictable 
insertion sequence, right? That's like a very, first of all, realistic insertion sequence. You're often inserting in things in order, and yet it's doing the worst possible thing. It's just making a path, and it's really not doing much organizing for you. It's just listing things in the exact same order you gave it to them. Okay, so that that's really the issue. Is that is that you can easily get imbalanced trees with a simple method, and uh, okay, and so I think you guys might have done this um, in your data structure classes, but you come up with all these like incredibly clever binary search trees to try to keep the tree balanced at all times. Okay, so I'm not sure which one you guys did, or if any, have you? Did you guys ever cover AVL trees? I think that was with rotations. What about red black trees? Yeah, and my impression was like hey, it was complicated. That's kind of all I <laughs> remember. Uh, you know, you mark some stuff and whatever. It works. Now we know. Okay. So so today I'm going to give you um, uh, an approach that is much much lazier. Uh, uh, the code will be extremely simple. There won't be any of this crazy accounting that you might have seen in your data structures class. Um, and it'll be very lazy. Okay, so hopefully it'll be compelling. All right, so, okay, so, so what are we gonna do? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep track of this idea uh, of writing down uh, the total number of nodes uh in every subtree looks like i actually miscounted here okay um so okay so for every node i'm going to write down the total number of nodes uh in the subtree and as i insert uh nodes i'll just keep updating this count that's not really such a hard to do so that's six hopefully that's five and hopefully that's 12. Okay, there should be 12 total nodes in the tree all right, so I'm gonna just keep, uh, so I add one more field to my nodes and it's just keeping count of how many nodes are in the subtree. Your data structure might have had that anyway. They often keep track of the size. Okay, simple enough, but what does this let me do? Okay, at some level, as soon as I have these numbers written down, you know, a particular node can look at the subtrees and notice if one subtree is way bigger than the other, right? Ah, oh, there's six on one side, five on the other. Okay, I'm kind of happy. That's pretty close to balance. I'm not going to do much better. You know, maybe I can look here and say, oh, there's one on this side, three on that side. That's a little bit more worrisome. Of course, with these small numbers, nothing really matters. But okay, but I have enough uh, information that I can very easily keep track of situations when one side is very, very lopsided. So what will we do? If I um, detect a really, really big imbalance, okay, so maybe uh, I find that this subtree has 101 nodes, and that subtree only has 50. Okay, so one side has more than twice as much as the other. Okay, there's a total of, I guess, 152 nodes at play in that picture. And at some level, I already have the nodes in sorted order because I can do inverse traversal and stuff like that. Okay. When I detect a really big imbalance like this, something very exaggerated, I have some rule like twice as big, but you could choose other coefficients, other factors. I will rebuild the entire tree. Okay. So what does that maybe entail? Maybe I do an inverse traversal and I write down all 152 nodes in a 152 size array. Okay, all the keys. I pick the median that becomes my new root and I recurse, median, median, recurse, median, median, recurse. And I will get myself back to a perfectly balanced tree. Okay, so well, I, I guess there's 152 total. So I, I should end up with, uh, you know, something like 76 on one side and 75 on the other. Now, how long would this take if I was good about using arrays and stuff like that? How fast can I rebuild a perfectly balanced subtree? Yeah. 
So it would, n log n is the most natural one because you think, okay, I have to sort the elements. That should take n log n. But you already have the elements sorted for you, right? Because they're actually in this tree. So you can, you can write down all the elements in sorted order. So let's say that there's k nodes in a subtree. This would only take you OK order k time, right? And you know k, so you know that the median is whatever is that location k over 2. You don't have to do a fancy median find algorithm or something like that to find median. You just jump to the location. Okay. So since you can jump to the location, you can do the whole thing in order k time. Okay. Just, but yeah. Yeah, so usually one rotation will take you a uh, constant time because you only adjust a constant number of pointers. It's always a little, you have to be careful about which pointers you adjust. Uh, but yeah, it's just a constant number of pointers. That's true. Uh, there are other rotation. I mean, AVL trees were based on rotations. Uh, uh, yeah, some level I, I consider these to be a little bit more intricate than what we're doing here. Here, I'm just kind of waiting till things get bad and then I just rebuild the tree. Uh, by whatever method you want, really. It just might as well be fast. Okay. So every time I detect that one side is, is very lopsided compared to the other, I just rebuild the whole tree to have perfect balance. And then that subtree is nice and clean. Okay. So uh, kind of conceptually pretty simple. Um, uh, Approach, I think, also very easy to see what the idea is at a at a high level. It's not coming from magical red black, you know, bits being set and stuff like that. Okay. So okay, so I think the 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 strategy is kind of clear. So uh, okay, so the insertion then is very simple. I just insert at leaves, just like usual, and I update some counters going back up the tree. And then if I find that you know one subtree is a lot bigger than the other, I just rebuild the whole thing. Okay. Now, clearly, the, the worst case running time is not great because I might have to rebuild the whole thing, right? But I will try to argue that the amortized running time is still log n. So on average, you'll still get that log n performance like you got from AVL trees, red black trees, and so forth. Okay, okay so. Um, okay, so first of all, the most important thing about this approach is that the height of the tree is always log n. That's really what we want because that dom tends to dominate the running time of all our tree operations. Okay. But why? Why is the height always log n? If I lazy rebuild whenever one subtree is more than twice as big as the other, why would the height always be at most log n? Yeah. Yeah, at a high level, yeah. So first of all, uh, yeah, so ideally everything's divided by two, then that's that's clear. We all know that if we always divide by two, we get log n. And, and in general, the data structure is, is biased towards this. It's gradually resetting things to occasionally reach one half. But at any point in time, it's not necessarily even splits at all the nodes. Right? But we do know that in the worst case, there's like two thirds of the subtree on one side and one third of the subtree on the other. Okay, so if I if I start at the root and I go left or right, you know, at the root we have n total vertices, right? And here's maybe the first root in the subtree. What is the maximum number of nodes I can have in this subtree? Yeah. 
Yeah, two-thirds n. Right, so in the worst, in the most lopsided case, I maybe have n over three on one side to n over three on the other. If it was more extreme, then I would have rebuilt. Okay, so every time I go down one level, I get rid of one third of the nodes and only two thirds remain. Okay. So put that all together and the total height of the tree is at most log base three halves of n. Okay, and the base doesn't really matter. That's still log n. Okay. Another way to see this is that if you go down two levels, then the biggest most you can have left is four ninths. That's less than one half. So every two steps, you decrease by one half. So that will give you a quick two log n as well. Okay, so by keeping things mildly balanced within a constant factor of being balanced, you automatically get log n height. Okay, so that's that's good. Okay. But the real issue is uh, is ultimately the running time, right? And in particular, when I insert something, I may have to rebuild it, okay? And that's expensive. In the worst case, it's gonna be very bad. But I wanna argue that I can get an amortized bound that's very good, okay? So what happens? Okay, so I'm at some node, right? And let's say there's a total of like, uh, you know, k plus one nodes in the subtree where there's uh, k over three here and two k over three here. And then I have to rebuild the whole thing, right? Okay, so uh, the point is that to rebuild this, I need to spend some time proportional to k, and that's bad. I wanna be able to charge this off somehow to sort of previous operations or something. Okay. So we have a couple of different approaches. We can do a direct analysis, that might be trickier here, or we can do a credit charging scheme or a potential function. Either one is fine, but does anyone wanna to try to suggest a way to account for the time spent rebuilding once something gets very lopsided? It's tricky because it's sort of our first example to done together. Yeah. Okay, so let's try a credit scheme. So maybe, um, you know, when I'm inserting, let's find my insertion picture. So I'm inserting this number seven and I walk down the tree, okay? Uh, and let's, 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 let's put one unit of credit on every node I visit on the way down, okay? So I will pay one unit of credit for all the parents where it gets inserted, okay? That's nice. How many total credits do I end up spending? Oh, yes, here it's four, uh, but in general, as a function of n, in the worst case. Log n, because that's the height of the tree. So th actually, it's, it's nice that we've already established that the height of the tree is already small. This promises that actually I never spend that many credits. I don't really mind log n, I'm going for log n amortized time anyway. Okay, so, okay, so, by the time I get to, okay, so every time I, I insert, I will also pay a credit at every node. That means by the time I get to this stage where some node is very imbalanced, okay, I want to argue that I have a lot of credits that can pay something proportional to k. Can I argue that I have, say, at least k over three credits? If I had k over three credits, that could pay for the k time spent. I think of each credit as doing 10 units of work or something. So remember, once upon a time, this node had no children. 
right? And then acquired some and became unbalanced. Or maybe it was rebuilt sometime before, right? So once upon a time, this subtree was completely balanced from some other rebuild, or maybe it was a brand new node, in which case it's an empty tree. Okay, so that subtree once upon a time used to be balanced. It gradually became unbalanced, but it also picked up some credits along the way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, let me clean up. Yes, perfect. So let me clean up the arithmetic a little bit because once upon a time when it was even, that means it probably had less than K and then K got bigger. So, so there's a little kind of retroactive K in the past. But the way to articulate what you're saying is that, you know, the number of vertices in the left is bigger than the number of vertices in the right, you know, plus K over three. Right? So, and once upon a time, left was equal to right. Maybe they were both smaller, but the point is they were equal. And they're only going up. So we must have added at least k over three nodes to reach this, this difference. It was this current value of k. That's the only, yeah. Okay, so, uh, you know, each, each time, you know, it got a lot, each time the score changed by one even, the credit went up by one. So every, left was still equal to right. And each time left you built the lead, you also got one point of credit. Hey, maybe they're both going up, but the point is every time the gap gets bigger, you get one point of credit. So by the time you reach this point where one has K over three more nodes than the other, you must have at least K over three credits, and then you can pay for the rebuild. Okay, all you need is something proportional to K. That makes sense? So what, what's really great Right is okay. The analysis was a little bit sneakier because we had to think about it a little bit differently. Right, amortized analysis, sort of a different notion. This credit scheme is a little bit indirect. But look at the algorithm. Right, this is obviously a nice, clean, simple algorithm. This is going to work really well in practice because you're not doing a lot of bells and whistles. You're keeping things simple. The kind of the the constant overhead, quote unquote, in the amortized running time is going to be very small. It's going to be bug free. Right, you're you're not going to mess this up because it's so simple. I'm sure you guys had bugs when you implemented red black trees or something. So, um, and that's often the trade off we find with amortized uh, analysis. The analysis is a little bit more subtle, right? There's a little more thinking, a little more work done on paper, but the, the code is great, right? And often natural. Okay. All right. So, all right. Maybe this will be more compelling. Let's talk now about deletions. You can insert keys and you can delete them too, of course. Okay. Now, the old fashioned way, if I wanted to delete a key, is I first go into the tree and I find the key. I'm ready to delete it, right? And then, okay, if, it's, if the key is a leaf, then great. Then I can just trim the leaf and usually it's not such a big deal. Maybe I have to update my red black trees or something, I don't know. But the real pain, if I recall correctly, is what happens if the key is not a leaf, right? It's somewhere in the middle of our tree. And if I sort of just remove this node, I have a big hole, right? And I don't know, I, I have these like vague memories of like, okay, in this situation, you need to find the node that's sort of the predecessor and the tree order and, you know, try to sort of insert it back up there or something like that. Uh, but it gets more painful if, if that is not a leaf itself, because then you sort of have to do some surgery and move the whole subtrees, and you have to be very careful to maintain all the tree orders and stuff like that. I don't know if you guys remember this, but depending on the, the particular choice of tree data structure, even once you find the key, you have to repair all this stuff. It's quite intricate. There's a lot of pointers moving around. Okay, so just like, okay, just it's just complicated. That's That's my recollection. You can do it. So I'm going to take a, a much lazier approach. Okay. When I uh, okay, or maybe I'll, I'll quickly ask: Does anyone have a lazier idea? 
Yeah. Oh, that's true, but that could be painful because there could be a lot here. Uh, and that'll take kind of k times log n, where k is the number of nodes down there, k could be however big. That is that is lazy though, so you got one half half credit for being lazy. Uh, okay. Any other off the wall ideas? Yeah. Not lazy enough. Too hard. I lost track, which means it's too hard. Okay, yeah. Uh, just create an optimal Okay, yeah, but okay. But so I'm, what I want, I'm trying to avoid is having to do a lot of work as well. So I want it to be kind of quick, and I don't want to rebuild the whole tree. So reinserting things, and possibly you can do some uh, attachment and stuff, but that's sort of like what the other data structures are doing, and people have thought about it. It still seems kind of complicated, whatever they came up with. Yeah. You could, but it's complicated. Yeah, okay. Here's the here's what I'm going to do. It's going to be even lazier. I'm just going to mark the node as deleted. So, okay, I'll add another field to the node. Okay, I'll have a flag that says it was deleted or not. And I'll just say, okay, this was deleted. Maybe I can erase the key if I want to save some memory. Okay, but I'm just going to mark the node as deleted. I'm not going to change the tree. I'm just going to leave it in the tree. I'm just going to mark it as deleted. And I'll update my search algorithm so that, oh, if it finds the key but it's deleted, they ignore it. Okay, I can leave the key there so I still know when to go left and right. Okay, but I'll just mark it as deleted so I know it's not supposed to be there. Okay, I think that's pretty simple. Okay, but it's not going to solve. I mean, there is some issues with this. What are what is the obvious issue with this approach? I think it's the the appeal is clear. It's very simple. Yeah. Yeah, so sort of my n and my log n, right? My log n will sort of always be n is the number of nodes written down in the computer, the number of nodes in the tree, but the number of keys I'm supposed to be representing may be much smaller. Okay. Okay, so the issue is that as I do many deletes, many get marked for deletion, I'm just using way too much space and my, my height is much larger compared to, it's no longer log in a number of keys, okay? Okay. Now, what's a lazy way to try to fix this? Yeah. You could also just count how many you have deleted. And if it seems like it's n over q, delete it. Yeah. OK, I'll maintain a counter. OK? I'll just keep track of how many I deleted. OK? Some number m or something. And once the number deleted, say, represents half the tree, I'll go through and I'll clean everything and build everything. Okay, so if half the tree is marked for deletion, then I'll clean things up. Okay, this way the number of kind of real keys in my tree is always at least half of the number of nodes in my tree. So sort of the log n is correct up to plus or minus one, right? I'm within a constant factor. Okay. So, okay, it's basically like garbage collection, but done in a tree. You're always kind of using amortization because you guys all use garbage collection, I'm sure. Okay. All right. How can I justify deletion? Right. Obviously, that in the worst case, that can take a long time. I want to argue it takes uh, log and amortize time. How can I give an amortized analysis of this lazy deletion approach? Yeah. So like without having to rebuild. And then at every turn you do that, you build it. 
Okay, so the height of the tree is log n. So you pay some log n there. Okay. And maybe every time I delete, I'll, I'll, I'll pay myself one credit. Right. And so by the time I've deleted half the tree, I've n over two credits. And that can pay for rebuilding the whole thing. Okay. All right, simple enough. Okay, all the work is done on paper as opposed to in the code. That's why I really like these ideas. That's why they're so practical in real life. Okay, good. So that, those are kind of lazy binary search trees. You can do insertion, deletion, and log n time by just kind of keeping track of some counters. Building things optimally from time to time. Okay, so you have more examples. Okay, so this one's really cool. All right, I'm not sure if there's any kind of programming language junkies out there, but for people who use uh, uh, you know, purely functional programming languages, I'm not sure if anyone here has used like Haskell or Lisp or Clojure or Scala. Anyone use these languages? Maybe, okay. Or what, uh, okay. Um, so they're really fun. But uh, one, one of their um, kind of ideas in purely functional language that sort of cleans up some things mathematically and stuff. There's this idea that once you write something down, you never rewrite the same location in memory. Okay, so it's called an immutable data structure. I'll, I'll explain with some examples in a moment. But the basic rule is once I write down something, I never rewrite in that same location in memory. And that's a hard rule. And, and while that seems restrictive, and it's a bit of pain to do some basic things initially until you get used to it, it has a lot of benefits. One is there's no side effects, right? You're playing with some data here, you're reading it, and you know that no other part of your code is gonna mess with the data that you have, right? Because it can't change anything that's written, okay? So it makes it much easier to reason when you're doing complicated big systems and stuff like that. To, in general, you always want to minimize side effects. This is sort of disallowing side effects as a rule. Okay. This is especially useful when you're doing concurrent systems, right? Now you have different threads running around. Once they start writing to the same location of memory, you're basically screwed. Okay, it's just a huge pain, and locks aren't even very fast. Uh, and then lastly, this assumption can really help the compiler. If the compiler knows that if I give them a piece of data and no one's gonna mess with it, then it can do a lot of low-level optimizations and speed some things up as well. Okay, so you really restrict the programming model, but it cleans things up, and then you can start benefiting from these stronger assumptions. Okay. All right, so, and even if you weren't using these languages, uh, you know, copy on write is sort of a, a, a common technique in object-oriented programming and stuff like that. So these ideas make their way out anyway. Okay, so let me give a, a really simple, you know, example that you guys all know is, is linked lists, right? So a linked list has one node, right? Uh, and one of these maybe points to some data, right? And the next one points to the next node in the link list, right? Okay, you have some data and stuff like that. If you're using uh, Lisp, and then this is called car, this is called Kader. Okay. And uh, okay, but now uh, suppose I wanna add uh, a new element to the beginning of my link list. I can add a new node, right, which points to some data. Okay. And just point to the front of my existing list. Okay, so I've updated the linked list and now sort of I'll hold on to a pointer to the new head of the list. Okay, so I'll, I've, I've pre pinned it to the list. But uh, I haven't written over any existing fields. Right, the red is brand new, it's a new memory, and the blue stays exactly intact, okay? So if a different part of the program was looking at this part of the list, right, 
another part of the program can keep working on the suffix as if nothing changed. Where the new part of the program can work with the red and still have access to the blue. Okay. So it's nice and simple. Okay, so all right. So in general, uh you often find yourself in a situation where you know you have an object with some fields, you want to change uh, field B from one value to another. Right? And the rule is that um you know, I can't actually write into the same field, right? So what we do is we'll copy the object, except the new copy, like we'll copy all the fields over, and the new copy will have that value replaced. Okay. Now, this is not so cumbersome because usually the objects you define just have a few fields, except maybe one of the fields points to something, which points to something, which points to, it could point to a lot of things. But usually the object itself has only a few fields, right? And so if I have an object here, right, that has maybe a, two, a couple of fields built in and then points to a couple other objects, right, somewhere else in memory, and I want to change one field, right, I copy the object, I change the fields, and I will copy the pointers, right? I don't rebuild this whole network of other objects in memory, I just update my pointers and I just copy the pointer. Okay, so in a sense, you sort of have a very complex object with sort of many fields implicitly represented, but you're only copying a few fields and that's how many you know, object-oriented systems are designed anyway. Okay, so this copy on write often isn't very painful because you're really typically copying just a constant number of pointers and fields. Okay. And then you get those benefits. All right, so, all right, so, okay, so now let's try to do two data structures and make them immutable. You guys know these. One is a stack where I push things on top and I take them off from the top. The other one is a queue, which in this picture, I'm putting them on top and I'm removing them from the bottom. Okay, simple enough. All right, one of these objects is much easier to make immutable than the other. Any guess? Yeah, stacks. Okay, how do you do a stack? Yeah, it's basically just a linked list, okay, where I just keep pushing onto the top of the linked list or removing from the top of the linked list. Now, to make it immutable, you know, when I quote unquote remove, so originally I have a pointer, right? This is sort of pointing to whatever that the head of the stack. When I want to quote unquote remove the top element from the stack, I don't like go in and change any memory. I just change my pointer, which is held on, you know, locally in my program. I just change it to the next item in the stack. Okay, which is great now because if some other part of my code was looking at the old stack, nothing changed. Okay, I just update my pointer to move down the list. Okay. If I actually wanted to kind of delete the, the top node, it, it'll be collected by garbage collection later. Okay, so um, okay, so stacks are naturally immutable. Okay, but queues are trickier. Queues are trickier. Uh, do we have uh, maybe no time for guessing? So, okay, so here's how we're going to try to implement a queue. Okay, uh, but still maintaining immutability. So in particular, I'm going to implement it with two stacks. Okay, one stack is going to represent where I put in elements. Okay, so I'll call it the input stack. The other element is where I take out uh, uh, elements. I'll call it the output stack. Okay, so when it goes in, it goes on top of the input stack. When it goes out, it goes out of the output stack. All right, simple enough. What's the issue? Uh, somehow they got to connect, right? I, I'll run out of out, and then I have to bring the input over. What should I do if I run out of? What happens? What should I do if I run out of uh, uh, output stack? What could I do? I guess there's not many options. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to flip it though. 
so we'll just flip the entire input stack over, copy everything. Of course, that's kind of slow. Okay. All right. So as we know, uh, old flash, I mean, you probably did like a doubly linked list or something for a queue that took constant amortized time. Now, what about um, what about this? Um, I want to argue that, of course, in the worst case time, I may flip a big stack over. But I want to argue that the whole thing will still take constant amortized time for each insertion and deletion. Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So so every time every time something got pushed into the input stack, maybe I, I pay one unit of credit. Right? I don't know. I can in general have a bank account. That's not right. Plus six or something. Okay. And when I have time to when I finally need to flip everything over, I cash in those credits and pay to flip everything over. Okay, simple, simple enough. So in becomes amortized constant because it just takes constant time to push on the stack and then you pay one credit, so that's another constant. And output is if you have to flip, that's paid for the change in credit. And then constant time to just remove from the top of the output stack. Okay, all right, so that's nice and simple. Uh, but you can see that with amortization and tricks like this, even though immutability might seem very restrictive, you start to basically recover all the old fashioned things by ideas like this. Okay, this way you can get the benefits and kind of use what you're used to, but in a concurrent environment. If, if you, for example, those binary search trees we did, those can easily be made immutable because they're just kind of parent pointers and you rebuild the tree on the way up or child pointers. So you can get kind of concurrency safe binary search trees as well doing lazy rebuilding and stuff like that. Okay. Um, I want to only briefly mention one thing because in the process of, of making some, some edits, I actually removed some slides. I think I was trying to copy one set to the other and I copied in the reverse direction. So only one, one very simple example I wanted to mention that you guys probably all use is array backed lists, right? And the good thing about an array backed list so is that you can access the 10th element in constant time, the 100th element in constant time, because it's just an array. The only painful part is if you allocated 1,000 slots and you find yourself wanting to extend to a list of size 1,001, you're screwed, right? You've run out of space and you don't want to allocate everything. So the standard uh, trick that you'll see in, in Python default list, and you'll see in Java array list and, and everywhere, you guys probably all know this, it's just a doubling trick. I'll just allocate twice as big an array. I'll go from 100 to 200, and then I'll fill in the 100 first slot. Okay, so over time, uh, it just doubles periodically. And every time I've gone from say, uh, 50 to 100, and now I need to double the size of my array. I've added 50 more elements. That gives me 50 credits to pay for the time to copy over to my bigger array. Okay, so um, so that is uh, that's it. So just with a simple doubling trick, you can look up these things in constant time, but then you get constant time amortized for append, uh, which which is very uh, practical as well. Okay, so you'll see this doubling trick sitting under lots of data structures all the time. Uh, so it's good to be aware. All right, thank you.